Next up is Sir Stefan Sorgson. Michael Woodson is going to talk about scaffolding early organization events and the patient service. All right. Everyone can hear me? Okay. Uh, so I'm Michael Woodson. I help run the cryo electron microscopy facility at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. So to just right in the front, give you an uh, executive summary. We have uh, gotten several uh, medium resolution density maps of the elusive scaffolding protein uh, caught in the act of oligomerization while uh, in a complex with the, the capsule itself. And we're going to, we sort of, I guess, gained insight uh, as to the details of the, the phage maturation sequence. And so here's a slide that I, uh, I thought everyone would be sick of at this point, but uh, this is the schematic of the tailed double stranded DNA phage capsule assembly pathway. So we start with the soluble subunits, some combination, you know, uh, captured protein and scaffold, and those self assemble into a metastable prohead. Uh, and then something happens, and we get a mature uh, capsule with no scaffold. Uh, it's much more stable, and generally we have uh, expanded volume and uh, angular shape. But of course, we can't be satisfied with just something happens. There's obviously many somethings, and ideally we'd like to know what those are. But this, this transformation is quite rapid. Uh, I don't believe anyone's ever seen uh, uh, a real intermediate. It's possible to uh, lock the process by blocking certain transitions, and you get these uh, somewhat intermediate steps. But it's not uh, clear how uh, biological they are. And even uh, with those, even if we assume they are uh, perfect representations of what happens in nature, there's still many question marks. So, uh, by coincidence, while we were studying uh, the motor function of the DNA packaging motor um, by 29, uh, we found particles uh, both before and after the DNA had been packaged, uh, and we noticed that the capsid was actually different uh, before and after the DNA package, even though the size remains uh, more or less exactly the same, and the hexons, which make up the majority of uh, the capsid, are all the same. The pentons were different, and even though the DNA is in the way, the pesky DNA, uh, you can kind of see uh, the difference in the hexons, or sorry, the pentons here. Uh, and this uh, different state in the empty capsid uh, turned out to be sort of intermediate conformation, so it, you know, we would represent the prohead as the smaller green uh, pentagons, and the mature as the lar larger figures. We see if the hexons expand, the gap between them expands proportionally, but the prohead is stuck, so it gets stretched out where it's attached at the threefold at the corners, uh, but it can't adopt the conformation it needs to in order to, to fill out the, the state. And of course, the hexons don't instantaneously transform as well. They must go through a similar process because um, the junctions at these edges uh, on every page, uh, but there's a different set of uh, parts of the protein that make up those junctions before and after the, the prohead transformation. So they must go through something similar to this. And the question is, why is this intermediate conformation short-lived in the hexons, uh, but long-lived in the pentons, long enough that we can capture it without even making it? So uh, we had a big hint in these clusters of density under the pentons that showed up when you move to the threshold, uh, density threshold slider low, and you can see things that are sort of just barely there. And we saw these five arm structures, uh, which we attributed to the scaffold. And a uh, crystal structure is available for 529 scaffolding protein, uh, thanks to what Mark did uh, many years ago. Uh, and it's a pretty typical scaffold despite its small size. You have two long alpha helices and a coil coil formation. At one end, you have a helix prime helix motif. And there's a short uh, four helix bundle. And now, this is the N terminal end, and this is the C terminal end here, where uh, two dimers join together uh, to make a dimer of dimers. 
And one thing that doesn't necessarily jump out at you, but uh, becomes an important detail, is the angle between uh, these two dimers is 72 degrees, which, which of course, is one fifth of 360 degrees, and it's the angular spacing between uh, the subunits and the pentagon. And uh, so I tried to dot that, uh, or you know, manually move that uh, PDB into our density, putting the uh, this dimer dimer binding area into the center blob and the internal areas close to the uh, in arms of the captain protein, and it fits well enough to be well enough to be interesting. Clearly, this is not the structure. This is not the same structure. And another aspect of the, the crystal structure that we should notice is that uh, if they, if we say that they join together by patch A going on to patch B. Once we form our tetramer, we still have a patch A here and a patch A on the bottom. So that means that we can add one more unit, and you know we can keep on doing that in theory as much as we, we have room for. If we had five, we have a decameric structure which viewed uh, above through the axis looks like a starfish, uh, like the stargates that River was showing us. More to the point, it looks like the uh, density that we see under the pencil. Uh Now, because these are stacked up on top of each other, they're not flat. Uh, this is the helix and it moves up quite a bit. So, uh, for example, this, this uh, proposed binding site is going to be very different from that one. So we don't really think that this structure could, could exist. Uh, and this one also uh, is likely not to exist either because we're averaging together a large number of, of, of uh, structures, you know, several tens of thousands to, to get our reconstruction. So there's no guarantee that there's any actual uh, structure like this. But to check on that, uh, we'll need to subbox out and classify uh, the pentons. So you know, taking a much smaller portion of the micrograph for each penton. And sure enough, we don't see any 5 arm structures. Uh, the largest we see is a, a tetramer here. And this one matches quite, uh, quite well the uh, PDB, the crystal structure of the, the gaffling protein. We see more often uh, just a single dimer. And then we see some uh, sort of blobs. And you might notice these here. I will get uh, go into more detail on this figure, but first I'm just going to try to introduce all the structures we have, and then we'll analyze them after this. So, a totally different, uh, well, not totally different. Another batch of uh, pearl heads prepared uh, independently. Uh, I wanted to gather up more particles so I could classify them more uh, thoroughly. I had the idea to uh, check the different pentons. Uh, to see if there were different structures on the different ones. So we started with T1, the one that's opposite the, uh, the new vertex, uh, the, the, the rarest pentons. So uh, separating them into two different ensemble classes uh, based on the C5 symmetry. Uh, I'm skipping a bit. This one had some pretty interesting blobs, but they were still just blobs. Whereas uh, uh, the second one, right away, we get just what we want to see. So five rotationally related uh, structures, you know, and then the sixth class, the catch-all class, which makes sort of a generic blob. And again, if you slice this one up, we see some somewhat interesting blobs, but nothing as uh, specific looking as this. And then moving on to the second penton, we see uh, more or less the same thing. Maybe if we slice up these other uh, catch-all classes, we would see different, uh, different ones. But uh, for the time being, I haven't done that, and, and it's not uh, relevant to this talk. So uh, taking these three arm structures and refining them uh, as best we can on their own, we see that yes, indeed, it's a, a tri-dimer, the dimer, dimer, dimer uh, oligomer of the scaffold. Uh, it matches pretty closely with um, those sort of extrapolated structures that I showed you early on with the PDB, uh, adding dimer after dimer. They do twist a fair amount in order to accommodate that, but it, it still is a fairly close match. The other very interesting thing, uh, to me at least, is uh, about this structure, is that it reveals that the capsid protein for 529 has uh, not one, but the two specific independent binding sites for its scaffolding protein. So it has the monomer binding site on the inner arm, uh, but then there's another one to bind a, a, a fully dimerized uh, scaffold protein. 
Jacob Tale. Starting with the Amara Diamond, the, the Monomer Binding Site, uh, this is the NARM. Uh, it's significantly larger than the average page NARM, uh, 529 page, and it forms a sort of cleft here. And then in some cases, we see this graph of density here, uh, and it always has the same shape. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not really enough to definitively fit uh, a portion of the scaffold, so we kind of have to, to make a guess. Based on literature, we, we decided to, to look at the helix turn helix motif that we saw at the distal end of the dimer. Uh, and it fits, uh, you know, you have to, to sort of try different uh, registrations, but it fits pretty well. And then as a, an additional stack, uh, uh, sanity check, I wanted to see how well could we fit, you know, two of those with a dimer. So I constructed a sort of simulation of what the, the true pro head of 529 might look like when the hexons as well were, were scrunched up and had their in arms on the interior. Uh, we don't have any density like that available or any model like that available for the hexons, so I just took two pentons and smashed them together uh, and ar ar aligned them. I fit one of them into the density of a neighboring hexon, and it seems to fit quite well uh, along the edge. Um, and then we see uh, the, the long helices don't have to uncoil very much at all uh, in order to get to hit both of those uh, monomer binding monomer binding sites. And in, uh, in reality, because these are both actually the intermediate state and not the prohead state, those uh, binding sites can be uh, we expect them to be closer together, so we'd have to uncoil even less. And another thing, once we have this simulation up here, another thing that's important uh, to note is that. Uh, these anons pack very close together. Uh, there's very little space in between them, but they don't touch, uh, which indicates that the fit is it's not spurious despite replacing hexons with pentons. Uh, and so the, the dimer binding site, the scaffold, the binding site to bind scaffold dimers uh, is blocked off by each of these three anons blocks their neighbor. So uh, this, the Co-head cannot bind uh, diamonds. That, that's not available until the hexons are extended. And the last structure, well, we've seen this, but um, I'm going to focus on these dimers. Uh, every single independent uh, reconstruction of a dimer had a, a pretty strong blob of density connecting the two coils right around the middle. And if you fit the PDB to the dimer, and we see two uh, histidines, and I believe they're doing sort of pipe stacking, and this kind of anchors the uh, two coils so that when the, the end terminal end unravels in order to uh, stretch across this uh, the, the cast on the edge to, to fulfill you know, bonding obligations for those monomer sites, uh, the C terminal end stays associated so it's, a, it's able to bind other diamonds. So even if most of the scaffold is uncoiled, it can still uh, make diamond diamond interactions. But, you know. So, that's all the structures we have. Uh, I'm going to start going to uh, focus on, on what I think are the important things and what uh, conclusions we maybe can draw from those. So, starting at the very beginning, the pentons retain a prohead like conformation longer than the hexons. Uh, and also, we see a diamond diamond binding angle for these uh, scaffold polymerization that matches uh, the pentons, but not the hexons. So, we think that uh, the particular angle that these scaffolds take when they uh, tetramerize or, you know, oligomerize is to make the scaffold, uh, scaffolding association much stronger at the pentons than at the, uh, elsewhere in the capsule. So, also, uh, we have these floating dimers. So, they're uh, stable enough that we can reconstruct them you know, they have a consistent position, but there doesn't seem to be anything connecting them to uh, the capsule at large. Uh, but, you know, something must be holding them there. And also, they only appear when we see density uh, in some of these uh, monomer binding sites on this uh, capsule. So, we conclude that uh, while the particular arrangement of it uh, isn't, isn't certain, uh, this dimer is oligomerized to, to other dimers which have unraveled and are bound to the MCP, at least one. 
and you know, presumably more than one for it to have a specific position. Now, returning to these classes, uh, one thing I'd like to point out. Now, these are normalized, and uh, they're all at the same threshold. So uh, the amount of density you see is representative. So if we look at the monomer binding site, how much density we see there is uh, kind of inversely proportional to how strong the dimer is. And so at these classes where the dimer is strongest, or we see a dimer at the strongest density, you see completely uh, unoccupied monomer binding sites. So uh, from this, we conclude that cold dimerization of the scaffold uh, is in competition with uh, binding to the captured effect on a monomer site. Uh, and related to that, we noticed that when we have a dimer, uh, one, but not two of the sites uh, are unoccupied. So from that, we conclude that the, uh, the other monomer, the other scaffold in the dimer comes from another source, which most likely is the neighboring hexagon. And so, adding all those conclusions up to make a kind of super conclusion, uh, scaffold polymerization of uh, its function it functions to pull the scaffold away from the neighboring hexagon, which leads to maturation uh, of those hexagons. So bear in mind uh, that 529, the uh, end caps of it are t equals three. So each hexagon has three uh, pentons uh, neighboring to it. So the pentons will pull a significant fraction of the, uh, the scaffolding away from it. Now moving on to uh, our diamond binding site. Uh, I didn't point it out, but the axis you can see, the axis of this uh, hexamer is totally different from the axis of the, the other set of uh, floating dimers that were, we believe, to be bound to the, the NCP. Uh, in, in particular, these ones are moved quite far away uh, from where they would need to be to bind the, the capsule. So uh, I propose that this dimer binding site, which only uh, is exposed after the exons have already extended, uh, you know, in order to mature the hexons, we had to make the the, uh, the penton scaffolding complex super stable. And so in order to mature the hexons, we need another intermediate step to, to mature that. So this dimer binding site, I believe, pulls the scaffold ligamers away from the binding site, from the end arms of the penton, which, uh, which allows the pentons to expand. And so here's a sort of cartoon showing our full uh, proposed model. We have association of soluble units. Dimerization helps assemble the prohead. Once the prohead is done, we start uh, associating dimers with one another at the penton until uh, they get pulled away from the hexons. Hexons expand. Uh, then the dimer binding site becomes available. Dimer bi uh, binds and it pulls the scaffold away from the monomer binding site on the in arms. The in arms are free on the penton. The penton uh, expands. There's no longer any way for the uh, scaffold to uh, interact with the capsid. It floats away, and then out in solution, it presumably dissociates and exits the capsid. So uh, that's uh, written out. All right. And, and just one last thing. Uh, there's a risk to delaying maturation. Uh, this is a structure we happen to see where the pentons have completely floated away. They're only bound at the threefold, so they're not very strongly attached. This sort of whistle ball uh, structure has been seen in other uh, phase systems, so it's possible that uh, the maturation is delayed in pentons and other systems as well. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, TJ and Wei Zhang uh, provided the prohib. Uh, the particular samples we did came from uh, Nikolai and Seth Scott, who worked with Kate Choi on the uh, PRNA project that we didn't end up hearing about. Uh, Mark Moray is the one who, who introduced me to the project in the first place, Misha Sherman taught me how to do cryo-EM, uh, and I spoke with this uh, somewhat extensively with Rob Duda. Uh, and thank everybody else for your time. I'll go first, please. Very nice talk. Um, the two, these things that cartridges for you the diamond diamond interface. Yes. That's it. I mean, I've seen not this particular case before, but I've, uh, other cases. Are those, the these things that PKA have run six point eight. This is this thing in, in, in Boston, not, not this thing in the polypeptide. Um, given that the pH of the cytoplasm is somewhere around seven, 
Mm-hmm. Both of these would have to be deprogrammed for you to get that dynamic down there. Is there anything you can say about the interface to ensure that they're on both deprogrammed and you don't have charge and caution? Um, so I don't know what exactly the environment is inside the captive. As, uh, so this is occurring while the DNA is being packed in. Uh, so I don't really know. I can I only expect it. they do seem to be interacting one way or another uh, for us to see that level of density there. But uh, I don't know enough about the local environment. Well, it's a kind of environment. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay. 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 So maybe not high high, but so. Uh, Something else. So I'm just curious, how did you uh, assign the things to the scaffold? Because you know, we know any pet might have something. You know, did you do some quantum performance to show there is nothing from the uh, source which might come for us into the pet that we should have some of the things so we don't bring up the scaffold fine in terms of the movement? Um, is it have to put uh, the least of both? Because you mentioned two with two drops. Yeah, so uh, uh, I showed data from two preps. Uh, I've looked at at least three preps, and all of them have uh, similar structures at the pink Um When we see that dimer that very clearly matches the, I didn't show you on the uh, in the talk because you know I already ran over the time. But uh, we can see you know side chain densities uh, when the scaffold dimer is bound to the dimer site. So we can be quite confident that those arrowhead structures are the uh, are the scaffold. Uh, we haven't taken any steps to rule out that if there's something else there as well. It's possible, uh, but hey Michael, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if you see those uh, the helix turn helix densities that we're starting to these scaffold proteins. Do you see those in the um, equivalent positions? Underneath the MCPs that be for the like surrounding the core of the So, uh, we don't see any unaccounted for density at the portal. Um, the portal is a little tricky because, uh, unlike T4, the portal vertex is very, very crowded in 529. Uh, so, to handle, and there's no extra protein to deal with the symmetry mismatch. So the captive protein unfolds to a significant degree around the portal. So uh, there's lots of uh, in the density map. Even if you try really hard to uh, get the symmetry, we have a good C1 wax where you see the portal pretty well and we see the captive pretty well. But where they come together, it's, it's fairly blurry, uh, and there's a lot of like so we wouldn't rule out being able to see scaffold, but. I think the scaffold by this point has gone from the portal. Yeah, the hexons are mature there. So, yeah, the, the, the portal does not touch any hexons. So it's, it's away from. Yeah. So, so we don't really expect to see it, and we don't see anything that requires that. That was my question. Moving to the development of speculation. So, uh, you said that the delayed maturation is at least. Yes. Do you imagine there being any reward, or is it one of these, you know, best, best possible local evolutionary minima type of things? Well, yeah, I didn't get into it, but um, so, prohead, we take it for granted that the maturation will start once the prohead is closed. But how does a hexon know, or a pentagon, how do any of these individual uh, molecules know if they're in an enclosed structure or if they're in an open structure? So that's a difficult uh, uh, question to, to, to ask. You know, and, and the motor, of course, can't start packing DNA in until it's closed. So whatever chemical changes you get in the interior, uh, it's possible. We saw that the, the ion exchange rates are uh, in the DNA simulation plot. The ion exchange rates were different. So it's possible that as soon as it's enclosed, you start seeing a change in pH and so on. Uh, but another option is uh, also pi 29 is small, its genome is small, it doesn't have, have as many tricks as something like T4 does. So, uh, in this case at least, uh, the, if the proposed mechanism here where the penton snatches causes the, the 
hexagon to expand, that can't occur until you have basically a hexagon that's surrounded by five, or that's surrounded by three pentons that are surrounded by five hexagons. Uh, and since uh, the unique vertex presumes, uh, it's often assumed that the portal nucleates assembly. Uh, the pentons around the uh, unique vertex aren't going to be able to fulfill that role. So basically, we won't start that process of maturation in this model until the opposite end cap is enclosed. And it's very likely that that won't happen until the full structure is enclosed. So that's the benefit that it has, is that you, you provide a mechanism to delay expansion until the prohead's job is done. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so good afternoon and uh, thank you for giving me, giving me the opportunity to present our work. So it will be about the assembly pathway of connectors of uh, Codovirales and FS viruses. So this work will be based on uh, our favorite uh, vector page, which is SCP1. So SCP1, uh, like uh, a <laughs> Uh, as a rotate vector phases, as a very complex uh, assembly pathway that I'm not going to describe in too uh, detail. So it, uh, it is a sequential, uh, it is a sequence of uh, events that will be uh, quickly regulated uh, in, a, in time and space. And the only intermediate I'm going to talk about is this one, so the nuclear capsid, so that's the final state of uh, capsid assembly. At this stage, so the capsid has assembled, DNA has been translocated for the, for the portal. And then you have two other proteins, so the adapter CP15 and the stopper CP16, that have been added to the portal vertex, which allows to, to close the channel and trap the DNA inside the capsule. These three proteins together, so the portal protein CP6, the adapter, and the stopper, constitute the, the connector, and that's what I'm going to talk about. By adding um, by adding EDTS, so we are able to disperse the nucleic acid and recover the connector. And that's what you see here. So we have a very nice grid of the cryo-EM grid of the connector. That's the density map so we got. And so we have an excellent resolution. So that's just a zoom, of course, at a particularly good position, just to show what the quality of the map so we can see a clear water molecules and the strength density. So it's one is uh, not a uh, uh, wrong tracing, but that's a likely a phosphorylated histidine, so that's a phosphorylated modification that is quite common in bacillus CP, which is the host of SCP1. So that's the structure that uh, we got. So it's, uh, it contains the uh, 30 subunits, so 12 copies, of course, of the of uh, the portal protein, 12 copies of the adapter, and only six of the stopper. So this one is the assembled structure, but what is interesting in our case is that we also had previously determined the structure of the individual component from a recombinant protein. So we have a structure of the portal, of the, uh, of the portal ring and NMR structure for both the adapter and uh, the solution structure. Just note that uh, unfortunately the phase protein are not very good at mathematics. And instead of assembling uh, into uh, 12 mer, the portal protein assembled uh, in a 13 mer. So we have to be a, a bit careful when comparing the structure of uh, the portal, uh, uh, the recombinant portal protein, and the one uh, from the uh, from the um, connector. So what we are going to do now is to compare these different structures, see what happens, what are the conformational trends, and try to understand how we can go from this to this. So let's start with the portal protein. So this one is the one that we get from the connector. So we find uh, the same domain uh, as uh, in the recombinant structure. So the, uh, the crown, ring, tunnel loop, stem, clip, and beta -airfield. Most of the structure, are, uh, most of the domain are identical or with a very small uh, movement, like in the crown, except for one domain, so that's the uh, clip, that is, that is a significantly different uh, in both the structure. But as I said, it's difficult to know whether it is due to the fact that uh, we, are, we, uh, we have one uh, in an assembly na naive uh, 
uh, one is a standardized component and one is a, is a in the assembly structure. So, but this step uh, anyway is uh, important because that's uh, where the next step is going to happen. Let's have a look at uh, the at the extremity of the clip. So we, we see that we have uh, a cavity that is uh, delineated by uh, several uh, successive uh, photomers. So we have three clips and one uh, petal film. And between these uh, four elements, so we have uh, a cavity and guess what? That's where the next cavity is going to bind. So this is seen uh, intercalate uh, in, inside this group. And uh, so uh, and it uh, will make a contact with the neighboring subunit. Once GP15 is, is done, what happens? So as I say, we have two structures. So the one from the connector and the one that is assembly naive. So um, as you see, the two structures are quite different. So we have a common core of uh, white helices that is identical, but except for that, we have this end terminal extremity in orange that has been completely, we have an helix that has completely shifted its position. On this uh, pink uh, loop here, as we completely refold in, it into a small uh, beta sheet. If we look at the substructure made by uh, the GP15 subunit, we see that this small beta sheet is in, in fact a part of a giant beta barrel that is surrounding the, um, the channel. We also see that uh, this uh, N-terminal helix is important in making contact with the neighboring subunit. So what we see is that we have a, a major conformational exchange that are associated with the uh, oligomerization of the protein. How strong is this oligomerization? So, of course, if we uh, look at the interaction between the six subunits, we have a very strong uh, interaction, with, uh, which is not surprising. But if we look at the interaction between GP6 and GP15 subunits, uh, we only have about 6 to 7 kilocalories per, uh, per, per mole, which is extremely small. That's uh, typically a kind of interaction that is extremely unstable and that would uh, be very transient. And if we look at the interaction between GP15 subunits, we have something that is much stronger and probably much more stable. What does it mean? It means that a single GP15 subunit is not able to bind efficiently to the, to the portal ring. And it, it will be the interaction between GP15 subunits that will help stabilize, the, the, that will multiply the number of interactions between GP15 and GP6 subunits, and that will stabilize this interaction. So, let's go back to the stru uh, structure of the monomer. So, I, I made a small lie. In fact, the real structure of uh, the GP15 monomer in solution is like this. It is a, a very mobile structure, so that's one of the good things of NMR. And we see that, uh, except for the central helices, all the peripheral uh, elements are highly flexible. The N-terminal extremity, uh, the terminal extremity, the N-terminal extremity, and uh, this loop that is going to fall into uh, a beta sheet. So, in fact, what we, what we have, it is not only a conformational change, but a also a reduction of the modulability of the protein that will be associated with the assembly of the connector. Interestingly, if we uh, dig into the PDB, we find uh, some, uh, a lot of uh, GP15 uh, homologs that uh, share some uh, uh, properties that are uh, intermediate between uh, our two uh, structures. This one is uh, from a page of uh, YQBG. You see that the uh, N-terminal helix has, is already at its final position, but we, are, we still have a highly flexible loop. So it looks a bit like uh, um, an early intermediate. Uh, of, uh, in, in the, um, in the conformational chain. This one is also interesting, so that's, that's from page uh, HK97. Uh, we also have the terminal loop uh, at the final position, and we have, uh, we have this loop here. Doesn't look very interesting, but this one is uh, from a, a ring structure, and if we look uh, into more detail, we see that uh, we have no beta barrel, but we have a nucleation of a small uh, beta sheet. In HK97, this loop uh, is not long enough uh, for, uh, for making the large, uh, the, the large beta, beta barrel that we have uh, in GP15, but it, uh, it looks like uh, something that, is a, that could be a more advanced um, intermediate. So, 
let's summarize what happens with the event testing. So we, are, we have a, a lot of different events that do not necessarily uh, occur sequentially, but each event will uh, help the, the occurrence of the, the other event. So we have the, uh, the interaction with the sticks, the reduction of the, the mobility of uh, the, uh, the antimonial helix, uh, the self interaction of uh, GP15, and uh, the refolding of this, uh, this loop into, uh, the beta bar, uh, into the beta sheet and then the beta barrel. So the last step is the formation of this beta barrel, and that's where the, the last step unit is going to bind. So we have a very complex interaction due to the fact that we have the transition at the step from the 12 fold symmetry to the 6 fold symmetry. So, if we look at the single uh, the GP16 subunit, we see that it interacts with no less than four different uh, GP15 subunits. And if we look, for example, at this residue, so due to uh, the spermine 77 of uh, GP15, we see that uh, this residue, depending on the, on, on the photomer uh, where it is, will form interaction with three different residues of the same uh, subunit. So now let's uh, have a look at what happens to GP16 what it, when, once it has been recruited. So it also uh, undergoes a, a significant transformational change, even if it is less drastic than in uh, GP15. So we have the same uh, beta barrel core, the, the same beta core, but we have this loop that is refolding into an helix. And if we look at the exameric structure made by GP16 subunit, that's precisely the, the, this helix is facing the center of the channel. And that's exactly where the channel is the nowhere. So we have uh, a width of only 11 uh, angstrom compared to uh, the diameter of the DNA double strand that is uh, 120 to 23 uh, angstrom. And it is by far the nowhere part, part in the entire channel. So it means that the formation of the helix is the event that will lead to the channel closure on the DNA trapping inside the capsule. Note that once again, uh, the conformational change is associated with uh, the oligomerization of the protein. And if you look at this procedure, this, this uh, glutamine, and also this tyrosine, you see that it is making a lot of uh, contact with the uh, residue of the, the nearby, nearby chain, which helps stabilizing the formation of this helix. So, I have a nice movie for to, to conclude. I hope it will work. Or maybe not. It works. So we start from, uh, from the portal. So we will first recruit uh, GP15. Once bound to the, so we will have, uh, once uh, we have several GP15 subunits that are uh, recruited, they will undergo the current story chain. So we have all the others that, that arrive. So now we have formed the, the beta barrel, so the surface of interaction for GP16. So GP16 will be recruited. Once recruited, it will also, it will also start uh, uh, forming its helix. And as, finally, we will have the, 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 ob the obturation of the channel and the trapping of the, the DNA inside the capsule. So, is it the last step? In fact, of course not. As I said, we are, we are at the nucleus capsid uh, stage. And, uh, of course, we, are, we expect other things to happen uh, uh, once the tail are recruited. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, the structure of the full particle yet, but it raises a question whether uh, what will happen when the, when the tail binds to GP16. There are two possibilities. Either uh, the, the tail recruitment will not do a lot, and GP16 will remain the subunit the that blocks the DNA inside the capsule, or the other possibility is that the recruitment of the tail will reopen the GP16 and that we will have an, another operation further in the tail. So as I promised, I'm going not only to talk about, um, uh, about SPT1, but also uh, about other microphase and the uh, hepatic viruses. And let's have a look at, uh, at how different uh, this uh, system are compared to SPT1. So the portal, the portal of all these uh, viruses are homologous. So they are, they are from, uh, we have find the same domain, except that XTMB, uh, so the FS viruses, have an, an external domain that is inserted in, inside the clip. So we have the storage that, uh, that is present. If we look at the connect, at the, at the, 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 the FS virus, such as XTMB, so we have no GP15 or GP16 uh, homologues, but instead we have this uh, turret domain that is uh, present. 
And so we have a, a, a very different uh, solution for the, the connection. If we go to uh, an, uh, an additional factor effect so that is quite distant to SPG1, such as T7, we see that, uh, of course, uh, the, the portal is, uh, is uh, homologous, and we, are, we now have an adapter, and this adapter is homologous to the one in SPG1. However, we don't see this uh, beta barrel, and the adapter in T7 uh, looks like a, a rather uh, simple version of the of uh, uh, was a uh, simple version of the of the adapter of SPP1. If we look at an even more closely related uh, vector effect, so P29, so this one has also uh, a ZP15 like uh, protein, and this one has, uh, has also de uh, developed a uh, beta barrel that is much bigger than the one in SPP1, and in fact, the, the beta barrel has evolved into the scale of the, of the page. However, if we look into more detail, we see that the topology of the beta barrel is not the same than in SPV1. So the, the, these two beta barrel lose the same, but in fact, they are not evolutionary related. So just to summarize, uh, so we probably, how is it possible to have a so different uh, solution? So probably we started from an, uh, an ancestral portal vector that acquired uh, an adapter. The first one that was separated was more likely the one of the viruses that uh, lost uh, the, the adapter and uh, instead gained uh, a turret domain in its uh, portal protein. If we look at the branch leading to take the bacterial page, so we have uh, the, the most distant uh, is the one leading to T7. Uh, so that kept its, um, uh, its adapter but did not involve uh, a beta barrel. And uh, then we have a uh, more, uh, we have uh, in, uh, in a particular phase that are more, more closely related to SPG1, we have the operation of a uh, beta barrel with so two different possible um, geometry. And uh, in the case of the P4 virus, so we first have the evolution of this beta barrel and the ground feeding to SPG1 uh, uh, acquired a third protein, which is a stop. So this uh, work has, has involved uh, mainly two, two groups, so ours in, uh, in, in Paris, so with the Paolo Tavares uh, that uh, initiated the work, uh, Sandrine Brasiles uh, that, uh, that first took out the sample uh, that uh, we observed by FireEM, and the group of uh, Elena Orlova, so Elena, uh, it's uh, a group that made, uh, that obtained the image, uh, so on the high volume. I also want to, to acknowledge uh, the, the, the group, uh, so the um, institution and uh, especially the diamond uh, for the query. So thank you for your attention. Uh, very nice structures in comparison. I just want to clarify about SP214 protein. So I think you kind of mentioned once this has a beta barrel. It's actually uh, 12 three stranded beta sheets, right? But yeah. uh, not the portal, but the adapter. That has a oh, the adapter, adapter yeah. yeah. I think you. But, but what happens to those beta sheets of the SP21? They all stay the same, right? Because there are 12 three stranded beta sheets. With uh, you, know. you mean with uh, the smithy detector? No. No, no, I just think of the clip, also for a second. So during assembly, any changes happen as a, you know, in to those three standard beta sheets or not? Because that probably stays the same, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, one thing that we would like uh, to be sure because, uh, as I said, so the recombinant of protein has somebody to a certain mass, so it's difficult to know exactly what happens during assembly. So if we look at the uh, structure in the recombinant protein, so the clip is significantly different with uh, this uh, helix that is uh, not at a more or less uh, horizontal position, but it's uh, an, at a nearly vertical position starting from the chip. So it's uh, very different. But, yes. but it still has those beta sheets back. Next, next, right? the, the, the thing? No. Now, the beta sheet? Yeah, it's made of three yeah. No. I'm not sure you mean the thing. All right, let's we'll discuss that first. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
GP16 seems to be the 12 volt to 6 volt transition adapter. Um, so there has to be, but there are 12 positions that it could bind to um, the protein above it. Yeah. So there has to be some kind of strength, some kind of cooperativity or something that prevents it from, you know. Yeah. It's so, a little foreign question, but. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I see what you mean. So we, we have to be sure that uh, we are not going to skip a position. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I understood. So yeah, so, that's, uh, so there are two possibilities, uh, I think, to avoid this possibility. The first one that would be that uh, it's much easier to place a uh, GP16 subunit once uh, its neighbor is already there. So it would mean that uh, it would be difficult to, to, to position the first one, and then the, five, the remaining five uh, would be uh, easier to place. The other possibility would be that, uh, the, as, it, as it is the case for uh, the GP16 uh, GP binding to GP6, uh, the interaction between GP16 subunits are also stabilizing the interaction with uh, GP15. So it's possible that if you have an incorrect arrangement, uh, the interaction is not stable and you will uh, detach quite fast. Just uh, following on from Fred's question, when the SCP-15 uh, attaches to the portal, do the it's three of the portal subunits, so do the two either side move at all uh, to change, or are they more or less the same? Uh, what, what is the kind of big question you mean? So is, is it three GP-6 groups, yeah. and do they all stay the same? Or do they change it anyway to, to bind the GP15? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, never mind. We can continue after the session. Uh, thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Final talk of the session is by Lindsay Brown. She is going to talk about mutational nutritional analysis of the core protein DNA binding pocket in a single strand DNA virus. Can you guys hear me? Um, so, this is going to be the last talk about FIAX 174. I know everyone's really sad about that. <laughs> And mine's regarding a mutational analysis. So, as we all know, uh, a part of the icosahedral life cycle, they have to condense their genomes into volumetrically constrained capsules. And in our lab, we work with BIAX 174, uh, and it's a Q1 icosahedral single stranded DNA virus, uh, microvirus, and it has packaging and genome biosynthesis occurring simultaneously, so capsid assembly is occurring while. Uh, the genome is being synthesized. So the parental strand is being displaced into the capsid as the daughter strand is being synthesized. And so this occurs during stage three of replication. And as we've heard before, the DNA guiding protein, uh, J protein, comes in, interacts with the DNA, and guides the DNA into the capsid uh, in between DNA binding pockets within the coat protein. And so the J protein is the guide protein. Um, and so here I have three related microviruses and their J proteins. Uh, and we can see that the uh, size, sequence, and charge of these J proteins differ. And previous studies have shown that G4 and alpha 3, which have short, the shorter J proteins, can actually be packaged with the larger 5X174 J protein and produce uh, viable infectious viral particles though the order or pattern of the ordered DNA does change. And studies have also shown that the inverse isn't true. Uh, we cannot package phi x174 with the shorter J protein. And research was done on those chimeric viruses by individuals in the lab before I got there, and they created uh, phi x g4j and phi x alpha 3j. And so I'm going to start with talking about phi x g4j, which Bentley talked about earlier. Um, 
And so we can see that in this sedimentation profile, that 5XG4J produces a small virion peak, indicating some viral production is occurring, but not quite as much as wild type. Um, and they found that the, uh, these complex, these are forming empty capsids, and as they are being packaged, they're either dissociating or the entire complex is becoming insoluble. And that these were actually rescued by one of the, or either of those two mechanisms of A star, by either duplicating those primary target sites or by exogenously expressing A star. And then we have Phi-X alpha 3J. Um, and we can see that Phi-X alpha 3J produces beautiful virion peaks similar to that of wild type. But these viral particles were less infectious than wild type. And they also were not attaching to their host cells. Um, this was not rescued by either of the A star mechanisms, and it was actually rescued by secondary mutations within the coat protein that participate in interactions with the J protein. And so, while the J protein is the guide, ultimately the destination is the DNA binding pocket within the coat protein. And in my research, I have uh, done mutations to um, arginine sites. Uh, at amino acids 214, 216, 233, and 420. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about just conservative and non-conservative mutations here. And so we're going to start with some efficiency plating uh, at low restrictive temperatures of 24 degrees and some rescue plating. And we're going to start with these conservative mutations of arginine to lysine. And so with all four of these mutations, we can see that we have some degree of cold sensitivity occurring. Um, and then we wanted to look at whether the wild type coat protein would be able to rescue these mutants. So we expressed it exogenously in the clone plasmid. Um, and we can see three out of four of our uh, uh, mutants were able to be rescued by this mechanism, but uh, rescue tended to be low. And so when we think about this virus, it has 60 coat proteins coming together to form the capsid. And with this case, we're having the expression of the wild type from a plasmid and the uh, viral uh, genome from, which is mutated from the virus. And we also found that the clone gene was producing or expressing at 20% the level of the viral genome. So we're getting mixed capsids here, which could explain the uh, low rescue ability. And then we wanted to see if the A star gene would be able to rescue these mutants. And again, three out of four of them were rescued. It was the same three out of the four as before. Um, and we can see that 214K was rescued by four orders of magnitude, uh, 216K two orders of magnitude, and 420K had more of an impact on plaque morphology. and went from having 10 per plaques to large plaques. And then we have this 233K mutant, and we can see it's a bit of an outlier. It's not rescued by either of these mechanisms. And this could be due to a dominant cold sensitive phenotype or a phi X alpha 3J like a defect or even plagiarism. And so before diving into the non conservative mutations, we want to take a deeper look at one of our conservative mutations that's rescued by A star. And so here we have 216K, and it's a sedimentation profile from a sucrose gradient. And we can see that at 37 degrees, 216K produces a very large virion peak. Um, and we don't have wild type at 37 degrees just because the scale made it more difficult to observe the uh, 24 degree profile. And so we can see here at 216K at 24 degrees, we do have a small virion peak occurring. So we have some viral production. Uh, we do know that we have viral production occurring. It's more than the input stage. Uh, from the initial infection, but it's less than that of wild type at 24 degrees. Uh, we also saw that this uh, looks like it is forming empty capsids that are either dissociating or moving into the insoluble fraction as well. And so looking a little deeper, we have the specific infectivities of the, uh, this gradient. And so we can see for 216K at 37 degrees, it's down an order of magnitude from wild type at the same temperature. So even though we're producing a lot of viral particles, they're already being impacted in their infectiousness. 
Um, but this is cold sensitive, so looking at the 24 degree profile, we're down two orders of magnitude from wild type at 24, and another order of, and three orders of magnitude from wild type at 37. So we can see that even temperature impacts wild type uh, infections, but we have something that is producing less viral particles at uh, 24 degrees and less infectious particles at 24 degrees, explaining the cold sensitive phenotype we observe. Um, and then back to that plating efficiency for those non-conservative mutations. And so this is going from an arginine to an aspartic acid. And we can see that they are both cold sensitive. Um, and both are only rescued by the mechanism of the coat protein gene. So rescue does still tend to be low. And so to compare to our 216K mutants, we performed a sedimentation uh, profile on the 216B mutant. And you can see we do have a nice virion peak for 216D at 37, though it is less than that of wild type at 24, so we do already have an impact on viral production at permissive temperatures. But then when we look at this 24 degree profile, we in essence see a straight line. Uh, so it's appearing as if at 24 degrees, this mutant isn't able to cause an infection. And then looking at the specific infectivity data here, for 216D at 37 degrees, again, we're down an order of magnitude from wild type at 37. Um, and we couldn't perform uh, the specific infectivity analysis on the 24 degree infection just because we didn't generate any particles. Uh, so here we have something that is less infectious at 37, producing less particles at 37 degrees, but it doesn't seem to be appearing to cause an infection at all at 24 degrees. And if we recall back to that Phi-X alpha-3J chimera, it was unable to uh, cause an infection in its host. And so we want to see, was there even an infection occurring here? And there wasn't. Uh, so we took whole cell lysates from these gradients and uh, plated them on, or ran them on a protein gel along with purified virion and uninfected cells. And we can see that for wild type at 24 degrees, we have this nice coat protein band indicating that viral production is occurring. And we don't see it in the uh, 24 degree infection for 216B. So this is looking as if it's not causing an infection at all. But does it attach to its host? And it does, uh, which is different than the Phi-X alpha-3J chimera. So we can see here we have uh, an attachment assay. Um, and this is the percentage of phage that was left in the supernatant, so unattached. And we can see that 216D does decrease in the amount of unattached phage in the supernatant as time progresses, similar to that of wild type, but not quite as efficient. And so we wanted to compare these infections as they progressed. And so we pre-attached phage to uh, lysis resistant cells, took half of that pre attachment and added it to pre warmed media at 37 degrees and the other half to pre warmed media at 24 degrees, and then ran those infections at those respective temperatures and took samples at different time points. And so, and then for those uh, samples, we ran them on a protein gel to observe coat protein production. And we can see that for both wild type and P16D at 37 degrees, we do see that coat protein banding indicating that viral production is occurring and an infection is occurring. Um, and then when we look at uh, the 24 degree infections, which we took samples at more spread out time points, uh, we can see that wild type at 24 is starting to form that co protein band as time progresses, taking a little longer just because the infection is running slower at those low temperatures. Um, but we don't see those co protein bandings at, for the 216 medium at this temperature. So between the attachment assay and this time course experiment, uh, we've determined this mutant is attaching to its host, but it appears to not be able to penetrate and cause an infection in its host. And so now going all the way back to the plating efficiencies, we can see that for our uh, non-conservative mutations, we didn't obtain uh, two uh, mutations at two sites uh, in the phage. And so this did include attempts using the uh, wild type co protein or cells expressing that and cells expressing the A star gene. And it could have been due to inefficient Q5 mediated mutagenesis. Or we thought maybe this could be a dominant or co dominant phenotype. Um, and so to test this, we placed these mutations in plasmids. And so I'm going to start with our uh, 420B uh, uh, clone. 
And so we can see that we do have complementation occurring with an amber S mutant, which doesn't produce any coat protein on its own. Um, and we do see that we don't have any uh, inhibition of wild type plating on this clone gene as well. Now, in comparison, our P14 B mutant doesn't complement with this amber S mutant. We actually have a plating efficiency that's two orders of magnitude lower than the reversion frequency. And we do see that we have inhibition of wild type class formation with this clone gene. So, this is indicating that this. Uh, mutation is getting into the capsid and kind of getting in the way. And so, in conclusion, we found that even conservative mutations to these arginine residues are conferring cold sensitive phenotypes, which some, and some of which of our, our cold sensitive phenotypes are A-star rescuable. Um, and this appears to be a hallmark of packaging defects, or packaging units. Um, and then we also found that some of these mutations were able to produce fully packaged particles, but they were not able to infect their host cells, and they were not able to be rescued by A-star either. So this may suggest that genome organization can affect the outer surface of the capsid. Um, and lastly, we did find that with uh, coat protein uh, mutations, we were able to see a dominant lethal phenotype uh, unlike the multitude of J protein mutations that we have. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank the university and Bentley for allowing me the opportunity to work there and work with him. And then also my colleagues in the lab, Elizabeth and Shane. I guess just trying to connect your last two conclusions, mm -hmm. uh, you can replace the arginine with lysine, and it obviously causes some problems. Lysine is a lot more flexible than arginine as well, so do you think that thickness of arginine is maybe as the package, as the DNA comes in, right? That mm -hmm. the thickness of arginine will allow it to allow the capsule to adapt more. Is that kind of what you're thinking, or am I just It could be. I think the biggest thing is that since we're staying within a positive charge and we're still seeing that difference, that impact on uh, infectivity and part bio part, uh, particle uh, production. Um, I know we've talked about uh, since Michaela's uh, talk about using an asparag or yeah, asparagine instead to see if charge isn't causing the problem here. Yes, I just requested uh, like, uh, one of those mutations led to abortion of absorption of the page. Um, we don't know if it was abortion of absorption, if it was uh, attaching and unattaching. Um, we just know that it wasn't able to inject its DNA or cause the infection. That was it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, that's fine for the